The title of tonight's message is The Holy Ghost Working with the Mind of Christ. The Holy Ghost Working with the Mind of Christ. To start this message, I will tell you this. In order to please God and be all that he wants you to be, and in order to take your rightful place in the body of Christ, in order to come into the living reality and greatness of divinity, the born-again experience is not enough. And it takes more than receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In fact, I tell you, taking on the mind of Christ is still not enough. As members of the Bride of Christ, you must go further and learn what it means to use the mind of Christ at all times so that the person of the Holy Ghost living within will have complete liberty to work for you and through you at every opportunity. In the Bible, there is a book called The Acts of the Apostles. In reality, this book is the Acts of the Holy Ghost working through the lives of the apostles. And this book also bears witness to the acts of the Holy Ghost, working through the lives of members of the early church. In the early reign, the Holy Ghost, in the early reign of the Holy Ghost, the reality, power, and greatness that comes by way of the Holy Ghost was not limited to the apostles only. And I want to confirm this by giving you examples. And as I give these examples to you tonight of different individuals, think and meditate on the kind of mind they possessed and the liberty that the Holy Ghost had in using them. The first example is young Stephen a deacon of the early church, a man, the Bible says, full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, who did great wonders and miracles before the people. He was the first martyr of Christ, who, when he was dying for the Lord, a glorious death, saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Then there's Ananias, a follower of Christ, who did not even live around the other apostles in Jerusalem. In fact, he lived in another city in Damascus. And the Lord revealed to Ananias many things to him in a vision. The Lord gave Ananias specific instructions, told him where to go, who to meet, and what would take place. How that Saul, the great persecutor of the church, was converted. And when he would meet Saul and lay hands on him, Saul would receive his sight. Now, think for a moment. What reality, what communion Ananias had with divinity? That Ananias was able to reason with God on a personal level, and God, in turn, was able to reason with Ananias on such a personal level. And he was not an apostle. They were able to reason with one another. And then Ananias went forth in obedience, and everything came to pass just as the Lord instructed. Now there's Philip, who, like the others I brought before you, was not an apostle. Yet he lived so close to God that at a moment's notice, an angel was able to speak to him, sending him out into the desert on a mission to rescue a lost soul. And he obeyed. He obeyed not knowing what was going to happen. So uh, there he is walking through the desert. Suddenly a chariot appears. And then the Holy Ghost spoke to Philip and told him, run and join that chariot. So he did. 
The eunuch in that chariot received salvation and was baptized. Then the Bible says that the Holy Ghost was able to take up Philip and carry him many miles into a city. To think that a person can be so yielded, soul, mind, and body, that an angel and the Holy Ghost is able to give specific instructions and immediately they are carried out. People may think it, it is almost unbelievable that the Holy Ghost would catch Philip up, carrying him many miles to another place. Yet something greater is going to happen in the future. For God is going to do something wonderful for the bride of Christ. For she will be caught up not into another city, not into another nation. She will be caught up all the way to heaven from earth. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians that people would be raptured according to the power that worketh within them. That power being the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a person identified as such by Christ. He was sent to earth by Christ to live and dwell in holy, sin-free temples of human clay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. And ye are not your own. Jesus walked this earth just as we do. And he came under subjection to weak human flesh just as we are. He endured all the trials and temptations, all the tribulations and persecutions that children of God are subject to. He understood the adversity they would face in life and the help they would need to be an overcomer, just as he was. Unfortunately, for most of the church age, Christians have lived far, far below their privilege because the baptism of the Holy Ghost for so long has been neglected or counterfeited. Many have denied the experience of receiving the Holy Ghost. Others that may have believed in this heavenly experience did not place the proper emphasis on receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For they considered the Holy Ghost baptism as optional, when in fact Jesus declared that the Holy Ghost baptism is an absolute necessity. John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus speaking, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Shortly before Jesus fulfilled the plan of redemption and ascended back to heaven, he gave his disciples, his followers, special information and instruction, which can be found in St. John's Gospel, chapters 14 through 16. He told them about the Holy Ghost and laid out the many purposes that the Holy Ghost would serve in those he dwelt in. Jesus received the Holy Ghost at the River Jordan, when John the Baptist baptized him in water. So I ask you, if Jesus received the Holy Ghost, why would any person claiming to be a follower of Jesus be so foolish, arrogant, or negligent to believe that they do not need the Holy Ghost when the one they claim to follow received the Holy Ghost. If a person truly follows someone, they will pattern after the one they follow. 
over the years, many people, many good Christians that have received the Holy Ghost would still come up short in their relationship with him. Because after diligently seeking and yielding completely to receive him, they proceed no further. In other words, the yielding ceases. They would allow self for the devil to convince them that the baptism was enough, that they had arrived. Well, I tell you, learning to surrender your tongue to the Holy Ghost is not sufficient. For once he comes into your life, you must then learn to surrender your mind to him. You must learn to surrender your will to him. And the only way that will happen is when you surrender your time to him. The truth is, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not the end of your spiritual journey in Christ. It is only the beginning. The beginning of a process, the beginning of a transformation, making you just like Jesus. The Holy Ghost living within will teach you, will guide you, will comfort you, and will help you into becoming just like Jesus. For without the Holy Ghost, no one will ever be like Jesus. That is an absolute impossibility. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, a person may have the Holy Ghost living within them, but the question is this, does the Holy Ghost have that person? In other words, who is in daily control of that temple of clay? Self or the Holy Ghost? Many have been misled, deceived, thinking that because they were used by God at times, all was well or because they sacrificed unto the Lord or for the work of God at times, all is well. Or because they obeyed the will of God at times, all is well. I have news for you. The mind of Christ in operation is in complete submission to God all the time and in all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Quench not the spirit. The only way a person will not quench the spirit in their life is by taking on the mind of Christ and learning to keep it in operation at all times. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, a child of God that is spirit-filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, they will never please God as they should. They will never be everything that God desires them to be unless they take on the mind of Christ. A child of God that is spirit-filled will never give the Holy Ghost complete liberty, total liberty in their lives without taking on the mind of Christ. Why is this? Well, there's a word for it. The reason is the natural, carnal mind is an enemy to God and to the Holy Ghost living inside of you. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. Paul spoke of this. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Paul speaks of being spiritually minded. Spiritually minded is having the mind of Christ. Paul speaks of being carnally minded. A carnal mind is using the mind you were born with. The natural thinking that you were born with. And if you as a child of God insist on using your own thinking, never seeking to take on the mind of Christ, the devil's going to get in. And in the end, it's going to be death, spiritual death for you. But those who diligently seek and take on the mind of Christ, they are spiritually minded, and it is life and it is peace. Child of God, if you have not taken on the mind of Christ in its fullness, whether you realize it or not, you have a major stumbling block between you and divinity. Because the thinking of a carnal mind is something that the Holy Ghost will not and cannot work with. For the carnal mind works against the will of God completely or in part. And this is where deceit comes in. Christians thinking they're okay because they obey the Lord in part. The carnal mind can do that. But it will not, it cannot obey the Lord in all things. The carnal mind again, will not obey God in all things. The carnal mind gives the devil liberty to work against you in your thought life, making your mind his personal playground. So if you're an individual serving the Lord and you struggle and you struggle and you struggle with mind battles and your mind is a constant battlefield all the time, no matter what you do, it just seems to be that you can't be free. You know why you're not free? Because you're using the natural carnal mind. The carnal mind produces doubt, fear, and despair. The carnal mind produces envy, jealousy, and pouting. The carnal mind easily yields to anger, hurt feelings, and strife. The carnal mind easily yields to gossip, ego, and all kinds of lusts. And if any of this is working in you, if any of this constantly troubles you, on and on and on, and it seems to be you just can't get free, it's because... You're using a carnal mind and not the mind of Christ. The carnal mind will kick against the pricks, resisting the will of God with stubbornness, rebellion, and excuses. The carnal mind will be offended at suffering, trials, and persecutions for the sake of Christ. I take you to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, to show you the mind of Christ. Speaking of Jesus, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I take you to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, to match that scripture in Philippians. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh 
hath ceased from sin. Children of God are instructed in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the just shall live by faith. Take note, those that are justified in the eyes of God not only use divine faith, they go beyond and they learn to live by divine faith. When a child of God lives in their feelings, they are not being spiritually minded, as Paul instructed. Instead, they are using the weak carnal mind in that moment. Therefore, the devil can fool them about many things. Fool them about their salvation. Fool them about their walk with God. Fool them about miracles and healings. The devil has deceived so many, making them think they were something that in the eyes of God, they were not. The devil has deceived good Christians, good spirit-filled Christians, because they were living in their feelings. They would be tormented on and on and on about their salvation and their experience with the Holy Ghost baptism. They would be robbed by the devil of miracles and healings they receive from God through false symptoms. I tell you this, the devil has no power or influence over the mind of Christ in operation. The devil has no power, no influence over the mind of Christ when it is in operation. Jesus already proved it, did he not? When a person is living by faith, as the Bible instructs, they are using the mind of Christ. They are being spiritually minded. When a person is living by faith, they have full assurance of their place in the body of Christ. And the devil is unable to deceive them or rob them of that which God has given them. Always remember this. The devil works against you through feelings and the natural carnal mind. The Holy Ghost works for you through divine faith and the mind of Christ. Again, I, I want to repeat that. The devil works against you through feelings and the natural carnal mind. The Holy Ghost works for you through divine faith and the mind of Christ. So to keep the Holy Ghost working for you day after day after day, you must take on the mind of Christ and learn to live by divine faith. Unfortunately, many spirit-filled Christians have not allowed the Holy Ghost to have complete liberty in their lives, that he is able then to perform all the duties Christ sent him to perform because they have never taken on the mind of Christ in its fullness. Because they are living more by feelings than they ever do divine faith. And as a result, their relationship with divinity is inconsistent. They quench the spirit time after time by not being able to yield to him at all times, and in everything. Understand this. If a child of God who is filled with the Holy Ghost, if they do not take on the mind of Christ and keep it working, that person, sooner or later, will quench the Holy Ghost in their life. It may even be unintentional. But it will happen. Years ago, the Lord revealed to this congregation through Reverend Angley that in the final hour, the hottest, most fiery battles for God's children would be the battles of the mind. The Lord let us know that he gets no glory from the battles of the mind. Therefore, God's children are to turn those battles over to the Holy Ghost, and he would take care of all of them. The Lord also instructed that his people 
are to spend time in the book, Battles of the Mind, every day, to read, study, and apply what they learn. Now, in the work of the ministry, I have learned that many good spirit-filled people have struggled with these instructions. They declare to have put these instructions into practice, and yet the results were mostly fruitless or, at best, inconsistent. To them, it appeared the instructions given by God did not work. But I'm here to tell you, these instructions given by God through Reverend Angeli are foolproof. They will work. Foolproof. However, understand this. These instructions were given to those that possess the mind of Christ. Because these instructions will only work 100% for a person who is using the mind of Christ. Remember, the Holy Ghost can only work in complete liberty with the mind of Christ. So a person who is using the weak human carnal mind, they will tie the hands of the Holy Ghost and he will be severely limited in helping that person with their mind battles. And all of the biblical instructions that God has given in the book, Battles of the Mind, on how to protect the mind. Well, those instructions were given by God for the purpose of protecting the mind of Christ in you. God takes no interest in protecting the weak, carnal mind that is an enemy to him. God takes interest in protecting the mind of Christ that you take on. So don't think you can surround, equip, and clothe, clothe, and furnish a weak, carnal mind. Don't think that the Holy Ghost living within you is going to wrestle and struggle with a carnal mind in an attempt to deliver that mind from battles. He only works with the mind of Christ in perfect harmony. So when a person comes to the place of taking on the mind of Christ and allowing it to operate at all times, this is when the Holy Ghost will be able to perform every duty in that person's life that he was sent to perform and do it in perfection. Friend, listening to this message tonight by way of television, by way of radio, the only way into the spiritual reality and greatness that I speak of tonight is through the born-again experience. That is, being set free from all sin and unrighteousness, being made a brand new creature in Christ through the power that's in the divine blood of Jesus. For Jesus is the cornerstone and foundation of eternal life and of all the greatness in divinity made available to the human race. And it can all be yours through the power in the divine blood of Jesus. And at this time, I want to say a prayer with you. It's called the sinner's prayer. Most of you in this congregation do not need to say it, but those watching by way of television, listening by way of radio, there may be those with sin in their life. There may be those with disobedience. Things in their life displeasing to God. This is your opportunity, friend, for the power of the blood of Jesus to wipe it all away, to give you a new life and a new mind, an eternal life one day in heaven. Say, O oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Lord, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe the power in the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sins, 
all of my sins. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus. And amen. And if you meant that prayer, truly meant it, Jesus is yours. And that means you can have a miracle. You can have a healing. The atonement on the cross was twofold. Not only for your salvation and freedom from sin, but also healing for your body. Freedom from all sickness and disease. And you watching by way of television, put your hand against mine on the screen as a form of laying on of hands. You listening by way of radio, put your hand on the listening device. That's a form of laying on of hands. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring those who are sick and afflicted to you. Those with a disease raging in their body. God, no power is greater than your power. And in the holy blood name of Jesus, heal, heal, heal. Let that blood power flow. Lord, break every bondage, lift every burden, make them whole. Deliver them for your honor and your glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And amen. And friend, you watch every improvement each day. You give God the honor and glory. And one way to do that is by writing us sending an email, letting us know what God has done for you. And be sure to go on to receive the good Holy Ghost and go further to take on and use the mind of Christ in this final hour. And God bless you.